Civil War, the Controversy Over Slavery. Let's go back to the year 1850 when Harriet Tubman escaped from a life of slavery in the South by running away to Pennsylvania, a northern state where slavery was not allowed. To divide the North and South on a map of the United States, it's easiest if you use what is known as the Mason-Dixon line. The Mason-Dixon line is an imaginary line between the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland. It was named after two Englishmen, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, who surveyed this land almost a hundred years earlier. The Mason-Dixon line became an imaginary line between the North and the South. Slavery was allowed in the South, below the Mason-Dixon line, but slavery was not allowed in the North, above the Mason-Dixon line. What are the major differences between the states in the North and the states in the South? Slavery was the most obvious difference between the North and the South, but it was not the only difference. The South relied almost completely on agriculture or farming for its economy. The economy of an area is the system of producing and trading goods or things. If the economy of the South was based on agriculture or farming, this means that the economy was based on growing crops and selling them. The farmland and weather provided the right growing conditions for certain crops that grew well in the South, such as cotton, sugar, and tobacco. Most farms in the South were small, with very few enslaved um, Africans, or even none at all. But they were also enormous plantations, like the one where Harriet Tubman was enslaved, where the plantation owners who grew these crops forced hundreds of enslaved Africans to work day after day under horrible conditions for no wages at all. On these plantations, enslaved Africans worked together, helping each other so that their lives would be a little less hard. The crops grown on these plantations were bought by people in the north and as far away as Great Britain, and that helped the southern economy grow. The north had farms too, but they were different from the large southern plantations. Some farmers in the north grew corn and wheat, as well as other fruits and vegetables. Some northern farmers also had livestock like cattle, sheep, and pigs, but the north did not have the right weather for growing the crops that were grown in the south, crops like cotton, sugar, and tobacco. People in the north could buy those crops from farmers in the south, so farmers in the north grew crops mainly for feeding people and animals, and enslaved Africans were not used on those farms. Unlike the southern economy, which relied on agriculture, the northern economy was focused more on industry and manufacturing. That meant that workers were paid to make things in factories, often using machines. Many northern cities were trading centers for iron, coal, and wood. A trading center is where goods are bought and sold. Northern cities had factories for turning iron into steel strong metal that would be sent to other factories to make trains, engines, buildings, bridges, tools, weapons, and all sorts of things. Northern cities also had factories for making bottles and jars, furniture, clothing, books, and much more. The factories in the north had access to railroads and shipping ports to distribute the goods made there. Because the south wasn't producing a lot of these things in their region, they could buy these goods from the north. People as far away as Great Britain would buy steel from northern factories, helping the northern economy. Factories were an important part of the northern economy. Thousands and thousands of people worked in northern factories. These factory workers were not slaves. They were paid for their hard work. It was true that factory bosses could be harsh. The pay was often pitiful, and the work was difficult, dangerous, and tiring. However, factory workers did have more freedom than slaves, and they had the possibility of a better life. Even though slavery became illegal or against the law in the North before it became illegal in the South, not everyone in the North was against slavery. Because slavery was not a part of their everyday life, some people in the North didn't even really think much about it. A small 
small group of people in the North, however, were absolutely against slavery, no matter what it did for the economy. These people saw slavery as evil. They thought people from Africa should be treated as free human beings. These people saw slavery as the cruel and hateful practice that it was. People who worked to abolish or end slavery became known as abolitionists. This group of abolitionists continued to grow larger and larger over time. By the mid-1800s, there were thousands of abolitionists. Some became famous, like Frederick Douglass, who had been an enslaved African who escaped, Wendell Phillips, and Susan B. Anthony. Those three are pictured here, but they were just a few of the thousands of people involved in the abolitionist movement. The abolitionist movement refers to the organized activities or events to end slavery. Harriet Tubman was also a famous abolitionist in addition to being a famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. She not only helped enslaved Africans escape, she also went around talking to people in the North, telling them why it was important to abolish slavery and explaining what they could do to help enslaved Africans. This image shows abolitionists working on the Underground Railroad. Abolitionists helped to keep the Underground Railroad running smoothly, making sure that as many people as possible were able to escape slavery. Harriet Tubman met and worked alongside many famous abolitionists. They printed newspapers with names like The Liberator, and they pressured or convinced political leaders like Abraham Lincoln to see why slavery was wrong. The abolitionist movement became a strong force in America, one that could not be ignored. Abolitionists and enslaved Africans worked together in, in other ways to rebel against plantation owners and bring an end to slavery. While many enslaved people were being helped to freedom along the Underground Railroad, others were trying to rebel or fight back against the plantation owners in the South. One such event took place in Virginia in the area that is now known as Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. In that event, an abolitionist named John Brown tried to get guns and other weapons to slaves to help them rebel against the plantation owners. In another event, a slave named Nat Turner led a group of slaves to rebel against plantation owners in Virginia. In South Carolina, another formerly enslaved African named Denmark Vesey helped plan a large rebellion against plantation owners in Charleston. Denmark Vesey's plan was discovered before it could be carried out, however. There was also many, many, many acts of rebellion by enslaved Africans against those who enslaved them. Even in these years leading up to the Civil War, there were many violent events in which many people lost their lives in the struggle to end slavery. The United States was growing, spreading west and adding new states. As the country expanded west, so did the Mason-Dixon Line. By the 1850s, states north of the Mason-Dixon Line were free states. In other words, slavery was against the law. In the states south of the Mason-Dixon Line, slavery continued to be legal, and there were more territories to the west that would soon be joining the country. The more the country grew, the more reasons people found to argue over the problem of slavery. As abolitionists fought to end slavery, they also wanted to make sure that the new territories and new states did not allow slavery. Others, though, did not agree with the abolitionists and felt that the new states should be able to decide for themselves whether or not slavery would be legal. By the 1850s, it was clear that the problem of what to do about slavery, whether to end it or allow it to continue and to spread, was tearing the country apart. 